and welcome to the He Doesn't Matter podcast, sponsored by Learners Ross Driving School and Drumbo Park Racecourse. Today, I am here with Paddy Kelly Jr., uh, who is former Donegal Celtic and Crumman United manager, and now currently up at Belfast Celtic. Uh, Uncle Patrick, should I say, harsh things. <laughs> All right, guy, not too bad. Good to hear from you, son. Yes, uh, thanks. brilliant. Uh, thanks very much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, what I want to do is tonight is actually start with, because we actually had competitive football back last week for the first time in a long time. And although it, it ended in defeat for you, um, would you like to talk about your Intermediate Cup semi-final game, how, how it went for you and where you think he's went wrong on the night? Um, I think the whole the whole idea of the game, Gary, to be honest with you, from the start was we probably got a week's notice, which yeah. to prepare for a game of uh, of that magnitude, I don't think it was really probably possible if you want to prepare the way you would like to prepare for a normal game. But it was the same, don't get me wrong, it was the same for the four teams, so um, there wasn't a complaint about that. But it was just the whole thing just seemed, there was, didn't seem to be an atmosphere leading up to the game, or it didn't seem to be the pre match which you normally do before a game. It just felt very, very flat, and that's not making excuses for, for Newington winning the game. Um, on the actual game itself, it was very much, Newington started off really, really brightly. Um, really, really good 20 minutes. And we were on the back foot for a while, and then we sort of gradually got back into it. Um, and Newington took a probably an undeserved one to lead. Um, and then we got back in it again, and they broke and went 2-0 up. Uh, and then when it was backs against the wall. But we got one back quite after their second, quite early after their second goal. Um, and we probably put them under a lot of pressure. But anybody knows Newington, and I'm sure you know them yourself, a very resilient team, they're very, very hard to break down. You know, you look at their record, they concede very few goals. Uh, and we knew we had a few chances and we didn't take it, but on the end of the day, on the end of the day very disappointing not to get through. But, you know, credit to Newington. Yeah, it, it, is it more disappointing that you've had a previous semi-final against oh. Newington earlier in the year where most people watching the game thought you just dominated the game and probably should have won it on the night. And then they come away empty-handed then and then the same last Friday night again, was it Was it more disappointing for yourselves and the players? Yeah, I, th- I think it was. You know, I think even the players from the first time we played them, um, the expectations were quite high within the, within the squad itself and the management. Um, Newington had changed a bit. They it brought a few new players in, a few young lads who I have to say were very, very good on the night. Um, didn't catch us by surprise by any means. I just felt at the end of the day, Gary, we don't take chances, we don't win football games. and Yeah. You know, we didn't take our chance to fail that night. Um, and in the first game of the semi final, we didn't take chances. So, yeah. you know, as I say, you don't take chances in that one football game. But as you said as well, that the whole thing leading up to it was almost like an anti climax. It, yeah. it, it seems to be if football is going to start again anytime soon, that the atmosphere that you'd be used to in them big games isn't going to exist with the lack of spectators, or if there's even allowed to be many spectators at any level of football. Um, can you see that just being something you just have to get used to then really as a club? Yeah, I think I think every club has to get used to carry it. Um, you know, arrive in the games, you know, like they don't have to arrive kit it out completely and you know yourself, that's not that's not the way to prepare for any game. Yeah. Um and if it's gonna continue like that, I'm not sure what way it'll go. You know, touch wood, hopefully things will start to get back to normal. But we never know whether it's gonna happen or not. You know, I think if you look at the Irish, the Irish Cup semi-finals, I think it was totally different to what we had to prefer, prepare to. You know, you weren't allowed the change rooms for a start. Um, you weren't allowed showers. You weren't allowed this. You weren't allowed that. I think the Irish Cup semi-finals were a different level because they were allowed in the different rooms. Yeah. You know, no doubt they were allowed showers and stuff like that. I think things like that sort of... If they don't change, don't change quickly, I don't think. Any club will, will want to be playing football when it's when it's like that. It just seems to, doesn't seem to be an atmosphere. Yeah, just gives like completely different game altogether. So yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I don't, I don't even, know, I don't even know why you know this. I probably don't because you're just in. I've just watched the Newington game on 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 TV there on YouTube. Yeah. And fail and Darling said just beat them two 0 Right, because it was actually just, I wasn't sure if it was still on the go or not. It was actually going to yeah, ask you, you know. Just just literally five minutes ago, just before it came up, um, I just watched the end of it. Darling said one two 0 and and to be fair, what I seen doing to them with a better team. You know, yeah. so it shows you always a better team doesn't win games, and I think that proved tonight. I think Newington were, will be really, really disappointed because I thought they played really well tonight. In terms of like then your season as a whole, so it's your it's your first year and as a management team and with 
with Mackers, uh, Steve McAlorum. And obviously the season, the league season was curtailed. And then Dunloy were then awarded the league points per game basis. And then, of course, two semi-final defeats where you obviously, as a club, showed your what you can achieve by even getting to those two semi-finals. But considering the fact that the season's now finished empty handed, is, is it a disappointment or should you be happy with what you've achieved this year and then just build towards next year? Yeah, I think, to be honest, a disappointment, yeah, 100%. The two semi-finals were certainly a disappointment. I think that the way the league was said, everybody has their own opinions on it, you know. My opinion was it should have finished the league. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, we were on a very good run when the when the league was stopped for obviously a very important reason. But to me, the league should have been finished, you know. And I, I don't, I'm not too sure about the points per game rule as well. But that's the way it was done, so we had to accept that decision. The two yeah. semi fans were really disappointed. The skinny son was really disappointed because I thought over the night, over the ninety minutes or an extra time, we were better shape. But as I say, that didn't happen. But on the second point, yeah, hundred percent, we're we're happy with what we've built so far because you know this time last year when we start to to re, uh, get a group of players together who we hope would do well. Um, I'm trying to build a team as it probably made ourselves really really difficult. When we when yeah. me and Mac took over, there was probably maybe three, maybe four players from Sport and Leisure who were who were still there. So yeah. we knew we had a job of trying to find players and to be fair, we targeted certain players. Who probably myself and Macros playing career my management career knew would do a job for us. Um, and we got to get a really good group of players and, and throughout the season we had some really good performances, some disappointing performances. But overall, when the season sort of came to an end, we're happy enough with what the squad we've kept most of the squad this year and it's really a building process. I think sort of six months in the in the, the year of, of a first team being being grouped together. I think there's a lot more to come from the squad of players well. Yeah, so I take it the club has big ambitions as well. Take it next season, the big aim is then promotion back into the Irish League. Then, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think first year getting together was was always going to be a tough year. It's going to be a tough year next year. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you look at the teams within our our own league who are who are obviously trying to get up, and then you look at the teams in the in the Mid Ulster League and the Amateur League who are trying to get up as well. So it's going to be really difficult. And I know there's only you know, if there even is promotion next year, nobody knows because because of the way they change the rules. So we don't know. But all we can do is probably hopefully win our league and then see what it takes us. But uh, you know, you some good say in our league. It's the right proved last year. You know, probably yeah. people didn't expect Dunloy to be there. People probably expected ourselves as the changes. Um and again, Dunloy is probably a bit of a surprise, but Dunloy are a good side, take nothing away from them, a very good side, you know, to go the length of the time they did on beating was a really, really good achievement. So Next year is probably five or six teams who could who could challenge for the top for the top place, and it's going to be really tough. Yeah, and then once you if you do win your league, then like you said, if then they get through either teams from the Mid Ulster League or Amateur League or whatever yeah. way the playoff yeah. will work. Yeah, well, this is it. This is it. It could be a playoff of maybe three or four teams. Obviously, you have to have the facilities to get up, which is probably a stumbling block for Dunloy this season. Um, you know, you have to put them in place, and you look the likes of. The Bally McCash have done recently, you know, St. James is obviously a player of Donegal Celtics, but so their facilities are fine. Ours is fine. And there's a few teams in the Ulster League who are fine as well, Crew United, Money Sane. So there's a lot of teams who can who can go up. So everybody's vying for probably that one spot. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, what I want to do now, then, is, is move on to you, uh, your playing career, your management career. Um, so, first of all, um, growing up in the streets of Lanadoon, uh where was your first club and then your youth team and then from there, where did it take you? Um, probably from very early age, guy. I was only, I don't know, maybe six or seven. Started playing football, probably younger than that. Uh, myself and my brother, obviously your father knows, we, we yeah. kicked the ball from a very early age. Uh, we kicked the ball and probably kicked each other as well. But um, always grew up, but whether it was Gaelic or soccer, you know, we both played both. Um, I just probably took a leg into soccer, maybe more than the Gaelic football. Um, and it was always Oliver Plumpet. Always yeah. Plumpet. You know, when you're from Lanadown, Plumpet was your club and probably still is. Um, and all my youth football was played as a Oliver Plumpet right through from academy age, five, six, right up till under 18. So that's yeah. where I grew up and that's where I learned how to play and, and, and no better club to do that. 
and then from from there then St. Albert Plunkett you then had an opportunity to move across the water then and how, how yeah. did that opportunity arise then and um, or did, probably before or did, before I got the opportunity to go left I was I was offered a trial at Middlesbrough um, at 13 13 14 um, and I don't think my daddy was too um, approval he didn't give me much approval of it because I was so young but it was sort of what, what players probably still do now and a lot of players done then you were going across for the weekend you were going on a Friday you were playing a weekend on a Saturday you would come back on a Sunday yeah. but at that, at that young age my daddy sort of didn't put me off it but he sort of went he wasn't too happy with the situation so I ended up I didn't go to Middlesbrough um, I sort of played off for Oliver Plunkett um, and one day we played a team from Derry called Derry Athletic um, there was a scout at the game a guy called Jimmy O'Hay a very well known scout uh, from Derry and he approached me after the game approached the manager Dominic McEnhill and said look we'd like to take Paddy on a trial to Leicester you don't mind and um, Obviously, approached myself, approached my, my mother and father. Um, went on the trial uh, and came back after four or five days. Didn't think anything was happening. And then we went to Scotland, playing a tournament for St. Oliver Plunkett in an hour. Yeah. Done really well, got the final. And after that, Jimmy O'Hay was at the game. Um, and he approached me again and said to me, Luke, we're setting the date up, you're coming across. So... Then I went over on probably early July. Early July I went over then uh, to say for Leicester. Um, and at that time there was probably a lot of Scottish people at Leicester, which was, was strange. A few Irish boys we were over with and, and a lot of Scottish boys because at that time Jack Wallace, I don't know why you've, you've probably heard him, famous Rangers manager at the time. He just took over Leicester probably yeah. the year before he came. Um, and he was a manager at the time with a guy called Daddy May, who's an Irish fellow. Um, so I went over there and, and played a few games pre-season, done a full pre-season, played a few games uh, and sort of sat myself in, um, sort of regular in the reserves. Um, and funny enough, at that time, the likes of Guy Lineker was coming through as well, which was, yeah. you know, when you see what Guy done in his career and you look you look at, you know, from a very early age, he was probably only 17, 18 at that time. Um, and you could see he was always going to be one of them players who would make it because he was so dedicated. It was, it was frightening. You know, he was... He was in before everybody had trained and he was there after everybody had trained and he worked on so many things, which obviously worked for him. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then sort of reserve, when from reserve football, a guy from Austin Villa was sort of brought in to overtake that, the youth setup at, at Leicester. Um, and I'm not too sure what the crack was. The Irish boys seemed to get a bit of a ribbon more than anybody else. Um, and then myself and a couple of other boys from Derry. Uh, it just didn't work out and more or less says, that's it. We're staying yeah. with somebody else, so they'll have to go home, and that was it, guy. That's our end. Do Do you think they're because they had Gary Lineker? That's why they let you go. <laughs> well, that's what I tell people anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, it's it's all, it's all right, Paddy. We've got Gary here. Um, you can just tell him on home homework. So you can't. That, that's it. Uh, yeah, he multi million pound player. <laughs> from, I went back and played for all the time. But there you uh, go. no, it was it was one of them. Uh, things at that time and, and you know I wasn't only one it was, it was disappointing obviously for that to happen but it, it was a big experience for me you know playing at then and then Filbert Street and playing with the players I played with yeah. uh, and it's something I'll, I'll obviously never forget but it's one of them since you know you look at players now even the present day when they go across the water it doesn't work out for them yeah. um, I think now it's probably even harder because of so many there are bringing people in from from Europe rather than bringing people probably from Ireland across because of it works out a lot cheaper for them as well. So, yeah. you know, it was one of my experiences, but as I say, it's something that will always, it's always hold memories for me. Yeah. So you came home, did you say from a town automatically in or? Yeah, well, I actually came back, Gary, and um, uh, Jackie Connells, uh, uh, Oliver Plunkett man, asked me to go back to Plunkett. It was sort of, obviously, when something like that happens, your head's down and you don't really want to be doing anything and yeah. took you away to get around things. Um, and Jackie Collins asked me just to come back and train with Plunkett. They were now with your league. Um, so I went back and done a few training sessions and eventually you got the, the, the buzz for it again and obviously same for Plunkett. Um, played away all, most of the season. Won a cup in the Corey Cup final, which is probably something you'd like to win at the present yeah, time. Which I didn't like, realise that actually. Never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Won a cup in the Corey Cup final, Robert Plunkett. Um, like the big Artie Russell was playing. Jerry Brown. Really, really good save, Peter McGoy. 
Um, and then just after that, Tommy Brannigan, I don't know why you know Tommy. Tommy was a plunker man as well, but Tommy had moved to UUJ right. uh, and took over management and he asked me to go there. So yeah. I, I, I sort of, they were playing the B division, the old championship then. So I went there and played there for about three months, four months. Um, and I got an approach from Ian Russell, who's a manager in Roma. Um, they asked me to come up and it, Oma to me was like a long, a long way away, which it probably is a long way away. But there was a couple of boys in Belfast who sort of made me made the decision quite easy who were travelling up and down to train with. Um, and that's where I went. And I, I loved it at Roma. It was a great club, you know, a great family run club in the Beta Basin. We got the Intermediate Cup final that year, first year, to beat. Um, but loving the team there. And, you know, I think it started the second season, about a couple of games, they had a double cruise at Lake in it. Um, yeah. And that was me, basically. That's how that's hard end it. Yeah, it's it's one of those things as well. What what year was that then? You done your cruise ship? Oh, probably nineteen eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah. Yeah, and then that what that's thirty four years ago, so thirty three, thirty four mm-hmm. years ago. So yeah. were you able to get operated on, or was that just yeah. when you done your cruise ship? Yeah. You were kind of done, or? Well, the the operation then was, um, you know, funny enough. At the same time, it was a Musgrave Park getting the operation done. Yeah, what happens you had to go on a waiting list. I mean, club yeah. then didn't put their players through the operations or anything like that. I obviously went on a waiting list, but I got the operations done quite quick. But it wasn't like, you know, six weeks of back playing football. It was, you know, give yourself at least a year, maybe two yeah. years. Um, and by that stage of me trying to get back again and put weight on, I, I probably lost a bit of interest in the game. Um, and I said to myself, I can't see me coming back to the level I want to play at. Yeah. You know, because I still thought I could give something back in at a certain level. Um, and it didn't then and it just sort of lost the interest and then the work situation wasn't good here um, and then sort of moved to London for a number of years more or less for work kind of than yeah. anything else so it sort of gave the football up for quite a few years Yeah, it, do you think as well do you, do you think your knee was ever the same because obviously advancement in technology now it's cruciate ligament operations or with keyhole surgery are a lot better I mean uh, if, if somebody if you've seen the leg I've probably a 18 inch scar one side and probably a nine inch scar the other side of the knee. So it was done then. It was done then with like an electric drill and it was put through your knee and it was like carbon fiber and sort of it. That's how my operation was done then. And that's why how they were all done. So you were never going to recover fully till the extent you wanted to. So it was always going to be a weakness in your knee. And I could always feel it was going to weakness in my knee uh, and probably a bit afraid maybe to go back in, you know, and maybe, you know, you saw maybe make that challenge. You're always sort of a bit weary on. And that sort of put me off, and that's probably where I stopped playing at that time. Yeah. See, I definitely, I got the Cali injury gene. I didn't get the football gene, but I, I got the Cali knee injury gene. So I did. So I did a view to play in France. Yeah, exactly. Like. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, when you went to London, was there any opportunities to play football there? Or did you ever think about it at all? Or was just you were done for a few years? Or? No. Well, I went, I went there and I got a good job. I got a good job in a construction company. Um, and I had a few friends over there. Uh, Dixie Green and Jim Burns and actually it was sort of where I stayed with and the London then was sort of work you know you worked seven to seven seven days a week and so there was no real opportunities but sort of after a couple of years I got a wee buzz again there was a local team who uh, sort of a wee bar I was thinking of and, and if you ever go to London or any morning and all the football or junior football playing on Sunday Sunday yeah which, which is me something that maybe has to change around Northern Ireland which is you know, every there's no junior football on a Saturday whatsoever, anywhere in England, because then it gives them opportunity to go to the Premiership games, the goals of what Premiership games is what all it's about. Um, so it was a Sunday football, and, and I got the opportunity to make a couple of wee games and watch them, uh, and then I got into a bit of training and I got myself reasonably fit. Um, so I started playing junior football again on Sunday. Now I was still only at that age. I was still only mid twenties, probably 22, 23. Um, so I was still young and um, got an interest in playing. Started playing well, started scoring a few goals for the wee local team and yeah. felt to myself, you know, maybe give us an hour we go. So there was a couple of clubs around where I lived who were playing in the sort of still around like uh, Hendon, FC and Finsley. Yeah. We're sort of what they're probably around about the National League now. There's no way there's so many different divisions. So I did get offered to go to Fancy and Hendon, but I sort of thought at that time. I don't really want that risk of just going back and maybe training two, three nights a week and 
with work I probably didn't commit me to do that. So I never took the opportunity. I just sort of played along with Sunday football. Um, and continued that basically and I was really, really starting to enjoy it, you know. Okay. But um, and then obviously with work and stuff and then it said to come home. Um obviously that was the end of a long a lot of playing, playing career, should I say? Yeah, <laughs> didn't go to the heavy heights of Hendon or Finchley, no, no, no um, definitely not. When you come home, then did, did, I know obviously when you come home, then you, you ended up at, at DC, but was that right away or was that um, was a few years later you got the opportunity to go to DC? No, uh, to be honest, Remy Bonner was a manager, um, I've always kept close contact with him, he's still this day, be one of my best friends. And, I would always be in contact with them. How the games yeah. were going, they were very successful at that at that stage. Um, and I came back, but then I think I came back on a Friday and Tuesday night I was up training with them. Right. Um, and I signed right away for them again. Um, I started playing a few games. Um, probably played about eight, maybe ten games, maybe. I was really enjoying it. You know, I was still quite young. I thought to myself, I could play at this level and and maybe have another five, six, seven, eight years at it. And after about eight games, guy had done my ankle ligaments and it just knocked me for six. And I just went to myself, This isn't for me, too many injuries, picking things up, it's the fact that you work. Um, yeah. And it's something I don't really want to be doing anymore. So I more or less packed it in. Um, and Remy had, had asked me to come along and give him a hand. And that's yeah. sort of when I started into the coaching management end of it. Then, once you went into the coaching management, you eventually became the, the manager full time. Um, how many years in total were you at DC? Was it? Um, 15 in total, Guy, probably yeah. 13 sort of, and then I left, and Poppy McCallister came in, then I went back for a period of about a year. So yeah. probably about 15 years. Yeah, and you, you started off in, the, was it the old uh, intermediate B division, was there? Um, the intermediate league, it was sort of teams in Derry, the yeah. direction that they, they were in, it was all played. Up there, obviously, we played our home games in Suffolk Grove, but you were playing, you were playing some good quality teams, you know, like the Dungiven, Oxford United Stars, Trojans, all them type of teams, and it was really competitive, yeah. you know. So that's that's where I had started out. Um, Remy had had sat down and had, that, that club had asked me to take over. Um, it was something probably I didn't think would happen that early, but when I did take it over, I really really enjoyed it. Yeah. And then once you took the club over, was the club's then ambition to go where Irish League? Was that then your aim all the gallery as a club or yeah, I mean I think it was always the sort of club's ambition when they first sort of formed and, and, and got to the level which I thought that maybe could step up at the next level. Um I'd obviously sat with a club committee and, and said, Look, how far do we want to go here? You know, my ambitions are to go as far as I can go. I had no badges turning at that stage. Yeah. Um or, or far do we want to go and, and the response I got was the Irish League so that's when I sort of sat out then of, of trying to build a team and build a club to for, to make that happen and, and it probably took us a few years but um, it was probably a big achievement from a club from, from that area to get in the Irish League and it was it's always something that's it's a great achievement you know for everybody concerned the whole of yeah. something to set out to do and, and you know God rest uh, a lot of the members who were there at the time, the chairman and the secretaries, we've probably never seen it happen. Uh, but when it did happen, it was, it was fantastic, obviously, for an achievement. Yeah. Um, how was it that you had to play off again, was it, to get in? Or? Yeah. Yeah, we'd uh, obviously, the chat, it took us a long time to get into it because we'd won the Intermediate League so many times. Um, you know, well, like I was there, at Intermediate, I was probably there for three, four years. And in that period, I think like 20 trophies were won, you know, yeah. in, in three, four years. That was like Intermediate League Cup, Intermediate Challenge Cup, League and stuff like that. So we got the level we probably needed to go higher because yeah. there wasn't any more to win. Um, and we kept a plan for the Irish League and a plan and a plan and we just kept getting knockbacks and knockbacks and knockbacks. Uh, and then Lurgan Celtic came on board um, and both clubs went to a court of arbitration and and all of a sudden, both teams were out in the Irish League, which was the end of B division. Uh, and that's really where it began. And then it was a matter of, of once you were there, the facilities were late, and you won your league, and you were getting promoted. So that's what we stuck at and built and built and built over the end of years. And it eventually yeah. happened. But yeah, it was a playoff. It was a playoff against Institute. Um, I think that year, Crusaders won the league. So we were in a playoff. Crusaders were in the, the championship with us. Yeah. Uh, and so we were in the playoff with the Institute. Two-legged affair, and our ground, DC, wasn't eligible for it. 
it wasn't passed. Yeah. So fair play, I will always hold them. I'll give them big thanks. Cliftonville allowed us to use solitude uh, for the playoff games. Um, and our first game was it was at solitude and we beat Institute 3 1. Uh, but then we had to go down on the Friday. I think that was a Monday. We'd go down on the Friday and play them in uh, Drum Hope. Yeah. And we always knew it was going to be tight. Um, and we went down, and funny enough, we got Gary Clifford sent a dog very early on. Um, so we knew our backs were against the wall, but we held out Gary and we, we ended up drawing the match in the leads. Um, that was it. So you were promoted in the Irish League from there, which was probably a big shock to a lot of people, but it wasn't a shock that people involved. You know, we sort yeah. of built for it for a number of years, and it wasn't a shock to the, the football people and close people who knew. Yeah. And totally deserved it. Totally deserved it, you know. Yeah, because you've come up with so much success as well. You were, you were ready for it, you were prepared for it. And was it the same year you got promoted you won the Stealing Sons, or was that the... No, we, we, got, we, got, promoted, we got promoted in 2008, so won the Stealing Sons in 2003. Um, yes, yeah. And it was, it was one of our situations we could beat in the semi final year before um, yeah. by Killalea, and that, funny enough, I was at Solitude as well. And I don't know if I ever remember the golden goal I had brought over here. It was... It was then for about a year, year, two years maybe. Right. In cup competition. So if somebody scored a goal next time, that was it, and game over. Um, and it was kill a lay and we drew, drew two each. And then went into extra time and they scored. So the match was gone, that was then. And funny enough, it was kill a lay. We played in the Stain Suns Cup final the following year. Yeah. So I think it was a bit of revenge, you know, that. And uh, lucky enough, we had a really, really good side, you know, some great sides up there. And we ended up with a big kill a 3 0 the final, which was. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember that game, but I couldn't remember how long it was. <laughs> it was yeah, because, 2003. Yeah, yeah. I was only, old, I was only kid. I know that's I it. Know. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was maybe a wee bit younger, and that's what it did. Uh, I think it's always if you Yeah, I always remember the game because um, at the end of the game, I remember your players you know the the old um, like the old like cages almost yes. for the, the things. All well, everybody jumped up and rattled the cages right. and all celebrating. I always remember out there so they from it, um, but. Yes, then from that success you've had, then moved into the Ice League and then uh, just basically built from there then because at that stage we're on a crest of a wave. There was a lot of support around West Belfast for Donegal Celtic as well and then it was just a case of trying to progress when the Ice League then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every, every sort of year was a sort of building process. We knew, you know, the Stain Suns Cup team was sort of built to win the Stain Suns, if you know what I mean, to a certain level. Yeah. Um, and then we won the Intermediate Cup two years later. So that was another progression. And then we sort of progressed to the Irish League. So like in the space of the time I was there, I know people say, you know, you have to build teams. Probably in the space I was there, you have to build four teams. Yeah. You know, for, for each occasion. And that's what we sort of had to do. And it was something you always looked at, you know, after you, you finished to say, right, we need to, you know, strengthen our position or we need to let him go. We need to bring these type of players in. Yeah. And that's what we sort of looked at every year, you know, myself and the coaching staff. And um, I was successfully done it at the Irish League and in the Irish League as well. And the first year was probably a bit of a struggle because we're new and, and it was backs against the walls, best against the big teams, you know, the Linfield, the Glenthorne, the Cliftonville. But we always held our own against the so called lesser teams. So we knew we were all right. So we held our own. And then after that season, we sat down and we said, right, we need to, we need to do something here. We're going to struggle. So down. And we got a few players brought in. A lot of players came through the youth teams, you know, local players. Uh, and we're strengthened by saying four or five really experienced players. So the second yeah. year was a big plus for us. You know, they're really plus. And we started to attract a lot of players who wanted to then come and play for the local club, which was which was great for us at the time. Um, and we were getting a bit of, of media attention as well because West Belfast and it was a, a big support. Uh, so we sort of built it from there, Gary. And... And then year by year, the length of time I was there, it got better and better and better. Yeah. Um, regarding the players, especially players who want to play. You know yourself, you have a player who wants to play for that club, that's half the battle. Yeah, because you're able to track boys back from, uh, local boys from other clubs, the likes of Stephen McAlore, yeah. uh coming back. Uh, your other guys are like Maggers coming in, um, Paul McAreevy and stuff from oh, Linfield yeah. around that time as well. Yeah. 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 So you're bringing in experienced Irish League players as well who were coming to their local team then, which obviously made you stronger within the primary division. Yeah, I mean, you know, Pat McAllister was a big, a big plus for us too, because Pat obviously was captain of Coleraine and and um, was probably one of the best in the one 
Irish League players still had a lot to offer when when uh, when I sat and spoke to him. Pat's a good friend of mine. And getting him was a massive, massive coup for us as well. Um, Sean Armstrong was brought back to the club. Yeah. Um, did you say Mac, Paul McAreevy was brought back to the club? You know, players of, of who had played for other clubs, you know, the Linfees, the Cliftonbills and, and things like that. Uh, you know, with saying the likes of Keanu O'Connor who came back from Bolton, Noel Corrigan came back from Bolton. Yeah. Players who were real quality players. So you, you knew yourself if you could jail a squad together, you would have a chance of doing well. And, and that's what we sort of looked at. And they did start to jail, you know, and at that passage end, at that passage of time, it was, it was a joy to manage the team because you had a bit of experience and a bit of youth. And as you, as you hit on right away, McElroy was probably the biggest positive because he was still a young kid. Yeah. You know, he was he was only he was probably only eighteen when he came back to us because he left when he was fourteen. Yeah. You know, to get him at that age and and mould into the player he became was was massive, massive for us. Yeah. Around that around that time then obviously he's had a lot of success and the club itself then you you've had glamour friendlies against the likes of Celtic, Atletico Madrid. Um, you had the Ice Cup semi final, which was reached, and then the highest position was, was sixth. You finished as well. So, yeah. out of all that, there, would, what would be the, the most enjoyable part of that for you? Would it be all those things, or developing players, or bringing local players in? Or I think I think Gary managing a local team is always it's always probably more pleasing if you can bring local players up yeah. through youth, and that's something that I always try to do. You know, and, and even playing the Premiership, we had a, a a number of local players who came through. Uh, the Glamour Friendlies were fantastic, you know, and even, you probably missed out, Jim Magill was manager of Ipswich, and he brought sure. a full Ipswich side over, uh, which was fantastic to play against the level of some of the players. Celtic was fantastic, Atletico Madrid was, was super, and it attracted big crowds to the club, uh, yeah. which was obviously good for the club as well, and it got us a lot of, a lot of attention. But you always, if you, if you can find one gem in a, in a local, and a local club to come through and progress in the Irish League, and hopefully touch would go across the water from your club. You know, job done. You know, that's that yeah. you've done as a club, and you know, lucky enough we were able to bring local players through, which was more pleasing than than the club of friendlies. Yeah, in, in terms of the end, uh, the success was said about earlier. Um, finishing sixth the season you did that was also the same year you the Irish Cup semi final, yeah. but yeah. obviously then you couldn't build on that success because. Of what happened, the politics of football. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you want to explain for anybody who doesn't know what what happened yeah. that year? Is well, at the year the year we got beaten in the semi final, we had well probably certainly for Premiership material, probably the strongest squad of players we ever had. Yeah. Um, really, really good squad. Um, I had also spoke to probably three or four players who were planned for the following season to come through as well, which was certainly a strength. And this Irish Cup semi final was a massive disappointment. Um, we sort of went from Christmas time right through that semi final unbeaten, you know, yeah. and that's playing the Blues, the Cliff and Bills, the Port of Downs, the Coleraines. And we had a really, really great chance. Semi- it was disappointing because we probably we lost it in sort of circumstances which wasn't pleasing as well. You know, we got the extra time and a couple of the sides didn't go away. That was a disappointing thing. Um, and the players sort of felt that afterwards. And at the time, sort of when when the politics started coming in, we were sitting sixth in the league, really comfortable, um, probably pushing the end. You know, at that stage, probably people didn't realise if we'd have got that final the Irish Cup, we automatically would have been in Europe because of the way things worked out. And, yeah. and people were laughing about Donegal Celtic in Europe, but, but it was a possibility. Yeah. Um, and if somebody had said that 20 years before, that would have laughed at you. Um, sort of the, what, what basically what happened was when we got to that stage was I don't know why the, the club, the football, started to overtake the club. Um, there was always a football club, but I don't know why it started to overtake the social end of it, or people weren't happy with that situation. At the end of the day, it's a members' club. Basically, yeah. that's that's how things happen. Members vote. They voted their AGM, um, and members weren't happy with the way the football was being organised or being run or whatever. Um, so at the end of the day, there was a meeting held. Some of the committee resigned. Um, the club asked me to come in for a meeting. I went in and met the new committee. Um, spoke to them regarding what way the football was going. Um, and to be honest with you, there wasn't much sense talked between myself and the committee of, of what way they want to bring the club forward. Yeah. So at that time, I thought to myself, right, I've probably done enough here. You know, I don't feel that the club want to go the direction that I want to go. 
Um, and that's what I'd say to step down. Yeah. Um, once you step down, then uh, the, did Pappy McAllister take over at that point, or was it? Yeah, well, Pappy, pa pa well, Pappy had, yeah, at that time he did. Pappy came in and took over. Um, and Pappy probably got, no, he didn't, guys, sorry, I'll go back. Pappy had took over, I'd stepped down before. Yeah. And then brought Pappy in. Pappy had, had been sort of, when Pappy McAllister was brought into the club, it was always the understanding. He was in the coaching, super coach. Yeah. He was taking the coaching, and eventually, when I decided to step down, Pappy was automatically going to step up the, the manager's job, uh, which he did do. Um, and then Pappy took it. Um, I had a couple of playoffs and stuff. Pappy they dropped out early because of the point system thing. I don't yeah. know if I remember that. Yeah, uh, that's it. That's what I was thinking yeah. about earlier. I, well, I actually got it wrong. I thought that was the same year that you just got the semi final, but that was because of the IFA bringing in new okay. guidelines and then they decided then based on a points yeah. caliber whether or not you stayed in the Premier Division or not so you weren't actually relegated as a club but oh no we weren't uh, and, and they never were relegated and that, that was the thing was um, at that time we were sitting so we are going really well and then they brought this license law in yeah. um, which and, and credit their club at that time they, they got everything in place you know, the committee then were fantastic. They got, you know, the, the, the club itself, the facilities in place, the finances in place. What they needed done, they got done. But it became the point system. And when the point system was was brought out by Anger, who were, um, I think, at the B division, were brought up the Ice League along with another club and, and we were put out of it. Yeah. Uh, with something at that time, we probably had everything set in place. I think the point system worked out. It was due to financial something you didn't have this much in the bank or whatever. I never really found the end of it. But what we later found out was it was clubs who oh, I'm not name them because in case it was legal. Yeah. It was clubs who who brought border cabins in on the day of their inspection and yeah. used them for showers and, and and as soon as the committee went away, the border cabins lifted out of the ground. And they gained like five hundred points this. There was also another club who put seat temporary seating in the day of their inspection. And when the inspection was left, the temporary seat was taken back out again. So those clubs knew how to play. We didn't do that. We just went by the book. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we, we, we uh, they put out a league for it. And that was something that sort of always sat and didn't sit too nasty with me. I think that's the reason that I left in the first place. But yeah. then Poppy took over. Um, and then Poppy, Poppy sort of built his own teeth squad and everything else. And then Poppy had his internal problems within the club he could probably yeah. explain that to you better than I could um, and then they had a few managers like that uh, Marty Talb came in um, and then Marty was was let go and then they brought me back in asked me to go yeah. back in and then that's that's sort of what happened with the club that was saying and we got the semi fine and stuff like that and then after that I left yeah um, you actually saved the club from relegation when you came back in as well didn't you they were on the verge of relegation that year weren't they yeah, yeah, they were t they were quite quite close. We're well down there, but uh, I don't know. As people say, probably a new manager comes in, players play for a new manager, and then um, and then once you get the old manager, probably start playing for him. But no, uh, it was still the same. It was probably the same bunch of players who who were there probably from when I was there. So I knew most of them, um, and and credit to them that did the set up that year, which is which is good because uh, then we were able to build for the following year. Yeah, when you eventually you were finished all the gallery with Donegal Celtic, that was. A through the disagreement with the club and the committee. It, um, that's obviously something which would still annoy you because it's the length of time you spent at, at DC. Do, yeah. do, you, do you feel that's still something which um, could have been dealt with better or it, you wish you could maybe change something that you did at the time? Or? It, it probably could have been dealt better in, in both parties. You know, um, I just felt that the club didn't want the club to go forward. And I think they thought I wanted the club to go forward too quickly. Yeah. Uh, so it was a probably a, you know a Achilles and always going to happen there. Um, and it was a sad, sad thing because we were going so well, and and then you know from that to see the state that the club went down, the decline that happened afterwards was really, really annoying. You know, yeah. people said, you know, Don, I, I had no grievance whatsoever about Tony Celtic. I loved the club um, yeah. and spent 14, 15 great years there. You know, just there was probably personnel or who I didn't agree with, and um, and that was mainly the main reason. 
Yeah. Um, and it was a job, the reason I probably felt annoyed about it because I think then we could have finished the job, you know, we could have built a really, really good set and been sitting in the Premier League for a number of years. Yeah. Um, and that was taken away, which was the annoying thing um, and probably to this day still annoys me. Yeah. Um, at that point then, it, did you have a bit of a sickener for football? Did you want to take a couple of years out? Or? Yeah, yeah, I sort of um, went... Um, obviously, like yourself, and you know, two two lads were playing. Colm and him were both playing. Give me a wee bit more time to probably go match them, which you don't do if you're involved in football, as you know. Um, yeah. I took a bit of time out and, and went and watched them quite a lot, um, and sort of cleared my head basically. Yeah. Um, and I, I probably didn't miss it for a while, but then I think if you're a football man, you always miss it. And I sort of started to get the wee the wee buzz again, probably after about a year, maybe six months, maybe a year. You get the wee buzz yeah. back. That's when you're watching and you're you're sharing this parents do instead of managing. So it was a wee thing and all this stuff on the main. The opportunity may come up and it and it did come up. Yeah, you, the opportunity and was going back and the crumbing United, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually I actually applied for the Stoby job. Um six months probably after the DC job. Uh, got an interview for it. Um, I didn't get the job at that time. I think Tim McCann got the job. Um, and then Tom McPeak rang me from Crumlin um, and asked, could he speak to me? Um, and I know Tom from old, you know, obviously playing against We always had friends up there. Always knew about their club and about their pitch and great amateur league team. I knew quite a few players who had played for Crumlin. So once I sort of went up and met them, um, sat down and I'm a, sort of near the end of the season. It was probably only about 10 games to go and um, and uh, what I said, I was sort of made an agreement with Tom and I said to him, look, I've no intention of sort of taking over the minute. I think I probably need another lot of months and stuff maybe in the summer. I said, but what I'll do is I'll give you more. It'll come in next year, pre-season. I'll take it from there. Yeah. So sort of agreement was made. Um, after about, about a week, Tom ran me up again. He says, come on, have another meeting. And I sort of had an idea what the idea was. And he says, look, we're really struggling here. We're, we're bottom of the league. We're probably close to relegation um, in the Premier League. And if they said to me, if we get relegated into 1A, it's a real tough league. It's trying to get back out of that. It's a, it's yeah. a problem. Um, so I then agreed to take over. Um, at, the, yeah. at that time, Pat Wall and Liam Burns were joint managers. So I didn't change anything. Didn't bring anybody in. I went up, um, worked with Burns and Walsey. Um, and lucky enough, we, we capped them up with a couple of great wins and, and kept them up quite comfortably. Um, and then from the next year, then it continued on. I had to have to say I had four or five good seasons up there. Yeah, up there. I actually, I'm just realising, I think I've missed a period of your career out there. Because after Danny was Celtic, it was Chimney Corner, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, it was funny. I was Chimney Corner. I don't know if you right, missed so. it or me missed it out there, but <laughs> both going with well, now. Yeah, it was, it was um, at the time, Colin was playing for Chimney Corner. That's so right, I was going yeah. to watch a few games, and I knew their manager. God rest him, uh, he passed away, Shay Hamill, a great, good man. Um, he was manager to me corner, so I would have had a chat with Shay and stuff. And Shay had said to me, um, he to go in for a couple of tests and stuff, he, he wasn't feeling quite well. So he said to me, look, would you fancy coming up and taking over for a couple of months until I get back on my feet? And, and, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Shay, I have no real interest in getting involved. And he said to me, look, come on up, meet the players. And I, well, I knew most of the players anyway. Yeah. So I went up anyway and I took over. Um, and it was probably the most difficult job I probably had in football because um, at that time Jimmy Carter was struggling near the bottom of the league and yeah. um, and not much not much players and it was hard to attract players. But again, I have to say, facilities, fantastic club, fantastic committee, super. Um, so I went up and took them over and it was, it was initially probably for about a month, six weeks. Um, Got a mercy and um, she passed away suddenly. Yeah. Um, real, real sad time for the club and the family. And um, so I decided that to stay on for a few more months. So I think I finished the season. And then at that time, I just said to myself, I'm going to just step down. And I think yeah. at that time, my father wasn't too well. So I just said, look, I'll step, step down and spend a wee bit of time with the family. But yeah. that was my time again. Chimney Corner it was great, great club. Yeah. So. Back back to Crumlin, because we missed that bit out. Yeah. Uh, you're four or five years of Crumlin. You started off at uh, 1A. Um, yeah. You eventually brought the club to the Premier Division. You had a couple of cup semi-finals in there. Um, yeah. how did you, were you happy with your, your time at Crumlin? Everything went? Or? 
Yeah, at, at Crumlin, we, we obviously start off at 1B, as you said, when I went in, Gary. Um, and sort of, I didn't change too much when I first went up, you know, a few, the boys were still there. So it sort of took over the last 10 games of the season and, and finished reasonably well after sort of suffering, not suffering relegation, threat of relegation. Yeah. Um, and was sort of built from the following year, started to bring a few players in who I sort of knew probably from the DC days and probably about the leagues. Uh, and strengthened us a bit. Um, and we had a really good season the following year. Um, and then we sort of built on that and built on that. Um, and then I think the following season we got promotion up to the Premier League, yeah. which was which was a good achievement, a really good achievement with a, you know, we brought a few young kids through as well and, and that brought a few local lads off in Belfast. Um, and played some good football as well. I brought a few coaches in, um, brought like to Johnny McChrystal, up as a goalkeeping coach. Yeah. Brought Michael Lapier up. I brought Guy Flaherty in, uh, who's a Crumlin boy, and Jeff Wilson, who, who are both still there at Crumlin. Um, two good lads. So we sort of built a good side together and, and we had success without winning. Um, the trophies were sort of, you know, we got the semi final of the Border Cup, we got the semi final of Steam Sons Cup. Um, and both disappointing loses or losses, should I say. Uh, but I have to say, great team, they're a great club. Obviously, great club, love my team there, and uh, good people, good people. Yeah, the success, but was the promotion back up in the Premier Division where Crumlin obviously wanted to be. The when Tom yeah. brought you in, that was obviously his aim then. Yeah, I mean that, that was sort of what we spoke about the first sort of meeting, you know. Um, and as I said, it, it was difficult to do. The league we were in was really, really strong, really strong yeah. league, some great sides in it. Uh, but obviously, our aim was to get it back in, back into Premiership, and we've done it within a couple of years, which was. Which was great, um, and then you were sort of able to build on what you had because it, it was harder to attract players when you're playing in one A, but you're playing the Premiership against the top teams. Yeah, um, it's that bit easier to attract players, and that's what, so that's what I found when we got the Premiership. Yeah, there's also that um, unspoken thing about uh, there's a lot of teams paying a few quid in the amateur league Premier Division, which we all kind of know about, but um, it's hard to compete then when you're an amateur club, a completely amateur yeah. club. And the yeah, players are it's, subs. That's it's certainly it's certainly not the amateur league as far as that's concerned. Yeah. I think we all sort of know that. Um quite a few clubs are playing, playing quite a lot of money. But um there's also clubs not paying money and, and they're quite successful as well. Yeah. So I think if you can get a group of players together, I think it's sort of like the Macalala proved and I'm certainly Cromwell Star proved. Um, you know quality local players and, and players who have probably been at a higher level and dropped down again. Um, them two teams alone were uh, still are probably two of the top teams, if not the two top teams in the amateur league. Yeah, yeah, which just goes to show it. the amateur league can be won when you do, like we spoke about earlier, get those local boys in, boys who want to play for the shirt. Um, yeah. your, your, your team at Crumman then, that was after a few years, then you stepped down then, so that was just to, to take a break from football. You had a long time managing because you started yeah. so young as a manager as well yeah yeah i mean it was sort of i think you probably know yourself it was probably more of family matters and and um you know the sort of past of my father sort of didn't help but yeah. at that time it was probably the right thing to do gary and uh and i, I sat down with a committee of crumlin and spoke to him and i said to him look these are the reasons why i need to step down uh, and i need time with my family and stuff and uh and I have to say they were great. And I said to him, look, if you need a hand, I'll try and help you find a manager or whatever. Um, and I've always kept close contact with them. Um, and it's great to see them back up, you know, doing so well again. You know, I think they maybe had a wee half season where they weren't great. But, you know, last season it finished really well. And, and touch wood, things go from strength to strength with them as well. Yeah, you've obviously left the club in a good position for Ken Caldwell told to, to take over. And they seem to be doing quite well to last yeah. year. And then... They could, they could potentially kick on this year and challenge the top teams. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, probably always the first result to look out for. And and, um, and, and Tull has, has got to get a great bunch of players, you know. Even mm -hmm. play, Tull's brought quite a few players in. Obviously, weren't there when I was there, but he, there's still a few who were there. And um, he has not playing some great stuff, you know. I'd, I'd get sort of reports from certain people on him. And, and if ever I'm free on a Saturday, which is very unlikely or very unusual, yeah. I'll always go back up and, and watch and support them. You know, it's that type of club. And, 
you know, I was treated so well by them and I always have that respect and I always will have that respect them and I'd love to see them doing well and, and touch wood, you know, next season they can push on from what they did this year. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So you, you took a, a break then for a year, two years and then you got the phone call f- to come up with Belfast Celtic then? Yeah, yeah. I was actually, um, I was actually working in London um, and Steve rang me. Steve, yeah. obviously, I've been over a number of years and he just said to me, look, I've been, I've been asked to do this job um, between me and you. I'm not going to take it unless you come on board. And I went, well, you haven't put me under much pressure there, have you, Stephen, really? And then he went, no, really need to speak to you. And I said, look, I'm not back until the following week or so. Um, and he explained a bit over the phone, but I said, look, I'll speak to you face to face. So I went back, back to Belfast that following week and we sat down and had a meeting. And myself and him and then we went and met the board and the committee of, uh, of Belfast Celtic. And I sort of knew all the the sort of ins and outs of from Sport and Leisure to Belfast Celtic and and to be honest I wasn't interested in the reasons it was to me it's football and I just wanted to get back into football management and um and we sat down and then we decided to go ahead with the job and and that's where we are now. Yeah it the club obviously has ambitions as well which I take it that was a, a big appeal to you as well getting back in yeah. the game. And, you know, the main thing was obviously the facilities they have sitting there, if it's, a, if it's a calm progress, you know, they don't have to build from from a lower level up. Everything's sitting in place. And even though they've done a lot of work to the club, uh, especially this season, um, and I think you can sort of always attract players that you want to attract um, at that level. And, and well, once we started grouping players together and, you know, getting the names of people who would sign, you know, like some Mark Clark and, Darren Stewart, Gary Warwick, you know, the Josh Lynch, these type of players. Um, players sort of went, right, okay, that's a good player, he's a good player. And, you know, from a pro say I could join. And, and lucky enough, it happened. Um, yeah. Being that just, just finished his probably playing career, you know, at the level he was playing at, we're, we're following in. You know, he still keeps himself fit. So Stephen's still a red sort of player as well. And, and no better players, no better any player who wants to play learning from a guy like Stephen McAlorman. Yeah. And the players take that on board. You know, he, he he's a great teacher. He's a great enthusiasm about him, and uh, he'll go far in that game. You know, that's what he wants to do. He really will go far in it because, you know, his passion's football. Um, he's obviously his family life, and and which is great. He's a few young kids and a young wife, and probably similar to when I first started as well. So I see a wee bit of myself in Stephen, and 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 yeah. Stephen probably needs that wee bit of shoulder to lean on as well. And that's what I'm there for. You know, I'm there for obviously to help him give him a bit of experience. But the enthusiasm comes from him. You know, he drives the players to a certain level. He knows what it's like to play an Irish league. He knows what it's like to win Irish Cups uh, as a player. And he wants these players to, to rally the same things that he got out of football. Yeah. In terms of then, um, you personally, that are you happy then uh, being his mentor and, and getting him along and, and sort of almost taking a back seat or in a way or does it give you the urge again to, to kind of take over a team yeah you being in full control or no it's a really really, really good question and loads of people have asked me this to be honest guy i probably wouldn't have took the job if it hadn't been steve mackle or Mason. yeah Do you know what i mean if, if somebody asked me to come in i probably would have said no but me knowing steven and knowing the way that he keeps himself and the way he looks after himself and the way he respects footballers and the way he talks to people um, it was an easy decision for me to make. Um, there's no decision taken by one person. You know, it, it's always a joint decision. If the team plays bad and it's our fault, we we hold our hands up and say it's it's our fault on this. We're not. You know, if we get criticised, you've got to take criticism, and we both take it jointly. Um, we you know we both pick a team along with Owen Begley, who's a coach, first team coach. So it, it's a group thing as far as we're concerned. Um, and obviously, you know the old saying: if you win the guy, you lose the guy, and that's very much what we have up with Bill Pass Celtic. Yeah. So going forward, then, you have we spoke about it already. Is of ambition as a club, you want to progress forward. So um, now that we have got a, an idea of how the season's finished and the season's starting again, I take it you've been working hard pre-season, even towards what we have ahead of us then. Yeah, I mean, we probably were late starters, Gary, compared to other clubs. Obviously, with COVID, we, we sort of gave were given out and, and we didn't really do. Players were training on their own. As, as you know, yeah. you probably set your own players in type of programmes. You know, set the players' programmes and, and no doubt, I think players 
playing now from 20 years ago, attitudes are totally different. Their, their fitness levels are so high at the minute because uh, it's such a short break between seasons. So yeah. players trained away and I have to say when we reported back probably three weeks ago, um, you know, we're doing one that a Saturday and a Tuesday or a, a Thursday and a Saturday, just mingle a couple. And it was all late stuff. It wasn't it wasn't any anything really tough. Uh, but now obviously we so we still no date when the season's gonna start. People are giving dates out, but we've no idea there's nothing confirmed. So the players are in their usual Tuesday, Thursdays and we we'll throw them in the Saturday as well to sort of build up for the start of the season. So so when it does come, they were ready to go. Yeah. And then hopefully get that promotion that you are seeking for so hopefully hopefully Gary I think it's a main aim you know as I said earlier all clubs want to get there into the, into the Irish League Championship um, and that's obviously our main aim this season you know we were involved in so many games last year you know people say you know why don't you why do you enter all these cups you know at, at the end of the day you want to win everything you enter and, and it's yeah. no different to Belfast Celtic you know a lot of clubs didn't enter some of the cup competitions uh but that's, you know, that's our choice and that's the way we want to do, you know. I think at the end of the season, we were 13 games behind on Loy, you yeah. know, with some massive amount of games to try and make up. But obviously, if you have 13 games to make up, you're doing well in cup competitions and, and that's what we've done. You know, we've done really well in all the cups. Um, and if that's happening, you have a winning team, you get a winning mentality and that's what you want with your team and that's what we got last year. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to go on to just a couple of questions about your playing stroke coaching career um so the first of all the best player you would have either played with or coached or even you can answer both um probably the best player that i played with um geez, that's a tough one guy there's quite a few quite a quite a few um people ask me this all the time and there was there was when i was young it used to be the same sort of Played the Mac a lot of Willow Banks, Star of the Seeds, you know, this is in the Plunkett days. Um, and then later on, I obviously played with Oma. Um, and there was a guy at Oma, and older people know who he was. He was at Ipswich Town, and he, he uh, played for Northern Ireland, a guy called Pat Sharkey. Yeah. Um, was absolutely incredible. You know, he was coming to the end of his career, but he was an Oma boy. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Oma, he was playing, he was playing centre midfield, and you know, a guy who you just look at and go, this guy can do anything he wants you. Yeah. And he was that type of player. You know, you give him the ball, he never lost the ball. His range of passing was terrific. His leadership was terrific. Um, everything about him, he was a player I sort of looked up to because I was a lot younger than Pat. Um, he was certainly one of the best players to play with. Um, yeah. a, a, another lad who who people probably don't, is a wee lad from down the falls called Danny McCullough. A wee lad from my play for Macalada. You know what a player he, he probably didn't get the luck that most people don't get at that level um to go across the water to play ice league but Danny was always one stood out the best player they ever coached without a doubt is Paul McVeigh and and uh, you know he's head and shoulders above above anything I've seen um, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of people will probably agree with that in, in terms of Maxi used uh Maxi was was across the water before he went to DC, but he was playing. Was he playing the Murray League when you say he was playing for a team called Hibs? Was it there? He was. He was. And yeah. it's, it's you know you talk about stories in football. We when I took over, Remy Bonner still stayed involved, and and uh, he gave a hand with the second team and stuff like that. So um, we'd actually sent Remy down to watch a guy called Nal Ward. I don't know why you know Nal. Nal's some Paul's man, GA man, yeah. a bit soccer player. Um, and he was playing for our seconds against the Hibs. So I said to Remy, go down and have a look at now, see how he's shaping up. You know, we'll, we'll hopefully maybe use him next week, bring him into the first team. Dead on, no problem. So why Remy went Saturday. So um, after the game, Remy comes up. Remy says to me, uh, you're not going to believe us tonight. What happened? He says, it's nice seeing this kid down here. the best kid you'll ever see in two feet. This kid is unbelievable. And I said, who is? He said, Maxie McVeigh. And I knew of him because obviously he'd been a Cross the water and stuff like that. And I knew he was playing for the Hibs. And I said, So what's the story? He said, No, I've signed him and all. And I says, Remy, you just you just can't sign anybody. He says, Well, I haven't signed him. He says, Look, he was taking a corner kick. He says, and I'm gonna know when he was taking a corner kick and says, Do you want to sign for Donegal Celtic? And Maxi went, I'll tell you after a match, but yes, no problem, we'll go up. So after a match, he went over and spoke to Tony Core, who was a manager of Hibs. 
And after that match, we end up with St. Maxi, even though it's ended there, there was no award. And, and that's how we signed him. Yeah. And I think at that time, it cost us 10 meter balls, which <laughs> was given to Hibbs. Um, and by that time, God of Mercy and Ricky Collins was the treasurer. And Remy says, uh, Ricky bought the 10 balls out of Sports Direct. So you can, you can decide yourself what the 10 balls cost. So we got, <laughs> we, got Mac, we got Maxi for probably about a tenner. And the tenner yeah. saying that the club ever made. Yeah, it. because the the amount of goals he scored for Donegal Celtic the whole way up was frightening, and even in the Premier Division as well. And I'm sure, well, it's actually a question that was asked. It'd be asked later in the Twitter questions. It was asked like, how did you keep hold of him for so long? He, he, we talked about loyalty at, at clubs, and you know, Maxi lived across the street from DC. Was one, yeah. one of our big, you know, it, it was something that we have sort of had that he wanted. He was able to walk the train, he was able to walk the match, he was able to walk home. Um, and he just loved the whole atmosphere. DC, you know, he, he loved obviously loved playing football. Um, and to be honest, guy, we had numerous offers of of him going to different clubs. Um, and he was approved several times, but he just always had this belief. Now, this is when we were in the intermediate league. You know, we had a couple of offers. We then got the beta base, and we actually had an offer um, of twenty five thousand pounds for him from an IC club. Nice. And twenty five thousand pounds is a lot of money. Yeah, and I'm talking about back then, it was quite a lot of money. Um, so myself, myself, I got the phone call, so I had to inform the committee. So myself, Remy Boner and Dixie Green, um, we went round to Maxie's house. Um, I'll never forget it. Right at the door, walked in, cup of tea, and Maxie's first words was, what have I done? And I said, you haven't done anything. I said, look, I just need to speak to you about something. I said, look, there's a nice league club come in for you. Um, they've offered us and I told him the amount of money. And I said, look, you can make a living out of this. You know, I wasn't certainly telling him not to go. I was pushing him probably in the direction of going. And I said, you have a young family, you know. Um, I don't even think he was working at the time. And I said, look, you can make a career, make yourself 10, 15, 20 years out of this, Max. It's entirely up to yourself. I says, uh, so we're leaving the decision to you. You know, it's a, it's a lot of money for our club to get. At the end of the day, it's your decision. So walking out the door, and he said to me, I've made my mind up and all, I'm not going anywhere. And I went, Max, I take a few days and blah, blah, blah. And he said to me, no, Kel, Kel, I'm not going anywhere because I love this club. And I said, Max, are you are playing in the Premier League, son? He says, Kel, I'm going to be honest with you, within two years, we'll be playing the Premier League. So I was left like that. And two years later, we got promoted. That was the first thing he said to me. But I mean, I told you that two years ago. He said, yeah. we'll be playing the Premier League. So I, that, that's a take a lot he was, and, and this day he still is, you know, but yeah. absolute, absolute gentleman, absolutely, but certainly the best footballer I've ever coached, without a doubt. Yeah, it, in terms of, like, the DC folklore, you'll, you'll go down and the, the history, like, big time, it, yeah. it's probably the best player ever to play for the club, really, for the longevity yeah. as well. Some of, the, some of the, the, the goals that he scored against top opposition, you know, even, you know, at that time you had... You know, Glenn Ferguson, you know, um, Gary Hamilton, all top, top strikers, you know, yeah. who were scoring. Chris Cannell, you know, but Max, he was matching them and, you know, goal for goal. And like at that time, we were bottom six, you know, fighting, struggling every game, but he was still scoring, you know, 20 goals, 21, 22 goals a season, which was anybody at that level was burning. I mean, in the championship, I think he, the year before, got probably scored like 41 goals. So the wee lad just had that in him, you know, he, he, for such a small lad and, and somebody who isn't really well made, he was just a complete striker. He had everything. There was nothing yeah. that, he, did, he didn't have one weakness. Yeah, because he could head up all as well, I remember that. So yeah. Kind of... <laughs> yeah, he could. Yeah. I mean, he got, he got up so high. I mean, probably people said his discipline was a bit, maybe on the weak side, but if you took that out of him, he wouldn't have been the same Maxi. Yeah. You know, he just wanted to win and that's the way he was. And, yeah, you know, I'll tell you a story about we were playing um, playing Lauren and, and we were struggling at the, the, the wrong end of the table. Um, we're playing Lauren at Suffolk Road. And one thing I sort of had on my players, and I'm sure you do yourself, you know, show respect to your management, show respect to your staff, show respect to anybody. Um, and after about 10, 15 minutes, I give instructions to a pitch and he shared something off, which wasn't very nice. Um, so I just pulled the lanes one up and I said, substitute. And the lane's one went, it's only like 15 minutes gone, mate. And I says, yeah, I know. 
and I said substitute. So who's coming off? Number eleven. So Maxi instead of coming over the other side of the pitch just walked off, put the substitute on. And anyway, we ended up won the game, won the game three 0 If we yeah. hadn't won it, I probably would have been sacked afterwards for taking Maxi off. But it was a decision which it took for all players and players respected that decision. And then after that, I sitting in the change rooms and people were saying, oh, he should have done it, shouldn't have done that. Then they and I'd sit in the office, five minutes door ups. Person Maxi standing at the door. Come on in. Shook my hand, he said to me, I'm sorry. He says, if something that's still not done, I'll never do it again in my playing career. And this day, he never did. Yeah. That's just that's that's just the, the caliber of the fella, you know. I'm sure, uh, especially at, at Donegal Salt, they get some characters there, I'm sure. Um, it's some... Uh, <laughs> yeah. a, a, it's a question of what I wasn't going to ask, but I know about the characters you've coached over the years. So who's the maddest player you've ever coached? <laughs> so many, I'm going to tell you, and say you probably built up four or five different teams over over the career of of players. Players, there was a lot of quiet players, captain sales themselves, and then you always had a group, you know, a group of players. You know, in the Premier League, we had a group of players we used to call the Gorgeous Gang. And, you know, it was Paul McDowell, Noel Cardwell, um, Noel Corrigan, Daniel Lands. You know, these type of players, um, great footballers, but the made sure looked after themselves, you know, the moisturizer and all this business and the shower yeah. and all that, always had to look good. Um, it was never really, you know, Maxi was probably not mad by any means, but he certainly was a big, big character in the changing room. You know, probably the modest was probably big Sean Armstrong. Sean Armstrong is, is such a footballer too, but such one of the wittiest guys you'll ever meet in your life. And he always had, he always had, um, something to say no matter what you said he always had something to answer back to you know and it always would have been funny so you may be doing a team talk and he said something that he made a remark and he would have burst out laughing or he maybe made a fart at it or something that's just the way army was yeah. um so he probably would have been the wittiest certainly the funniest guy but with, within the group of players that i had um but i'll say some characters within within the group of you know you go back to you know the Kieran connors even Sean Fox is all smiling players, Joe Dunley, Brandy Allsops, all these players, all characters in their own right. Yeah. Uh, but they just seem to they want to do things and they wanted to play with each other and they were friends, they gather off and on the pitch. Um and that's probably why the success was so good at DC. Yeah, big time. Um but in terms of your uh, career overall, playing, coaching, um, what would be your, your worst moment in football and your best moment in football? Probably, probably the best one we touched on earlier was probably getting promoted. Yeah. Probably the Irish League was was probably the best moment. Um, obviously, Stephen Sons was was great. Uh, we won the Icing Awards as well, which was was a massive achievement. This has gone back a long time ago. You know, from yeah. a club from West Belfast, such an award to win. Um, that was a real, real big high. Um, you always have your lows as well. You know. Losing cup finals, losing any sort of losing was a was a, a disappointment. Um, probably the time that we didn't we could put out a league because of the the point system was probably the biggest disappointment I've had. Yeah. You know, um, as a manager, because you knew we had done everything right on our behalf. The players, me going back to the players when that happened, and saying we put out a league was something that I would never want to do again. Because I looked at the players who worked so hard that season to finish. 10th or whatever we finished ninth in that league that year <clears throat> to be put out over a point system was probably the biggest disappointment I've ever had in my yeah. career. It's because it hasn't happened on the pitch as well, it's completely out of your control, yeah, which makes it worse. Yeah. As yeah. Well. And that's obviously what the players said too, you know, they, they come up with their own and we probably lost players over that, you know, real good yeah. players because obviously they wanted a further career and they would have probably went to the Premiership, but we obviously yeah. had to drop back into the Championship. So that yeah. would be that would be that. Sorry. Definitely. I'm going to move on to a couple of the Twitter questions. So, first of all, um, your partner in crime, Maggers, asked um, what what happened the time you had to go searching for all these DC players that went missing? Um, I'll tell you, that was we were playing Glen Torn on a Monday night in a league game. Um, so, we had no game on the Saturday. So, we trained on a Thursday and obviously the defence band put on, on all players this day and we always put on a 40 at our drinks ban from yeah. the Thursday night that was it so the drinks ban was still on on the Sunday um, 
but I'd later heard from a few people that quite a few of players were on the drink on the Sunday. Um, so it sent a few people out to do a few searches around the pubs, but couldn't find any of the players. Um, normal, normal hangouts, Swilly, the, the, the one that wouldn't have drank in the DC because of what it brought back to me. <laughs> the Swilly, the PD, the Hunt Lodge, and couldn't find them. Couldn't find them at all. Um, so we played game turn on the Monday night, and we beat 6 1. And it was a total embarrassment. I mean, a total embarrassment. But I later found out the role of the house party on a Saturday night. And they obviously stayed in the house party all day Sunday as well. Well, that's why I couldn't find them. And I sent a search party every pub in West Belfast. So that's where they were. They were all at the house party. But they were sort of not embarrassed by any means. It was, it was disappointing because of what they'd done. It was a wee bit unprofessional. Yeah. So we actually sat down and regrouped as a bunch of players. Um, and two weeks later, we played Glen Torn at the Oval in the quarter final Aries Cup and beat them 2 1. So I forgive them for, for what they've yeah. done two weeks before. Huh? <laughs> you have to then, so you do. Shay Kennedy asked that about the time you were in Shoot Magazine. Do you remember us? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> he says he actually remembers us. It must have been because you're a boy from West Belfast. He uh, says you were, you were in Shoot Magazine and you were tipped as the next best thing in English football, apparently. Yeah, well, somebody, somebody had told me, but I'd never actually seen it. Uh, but a couple of people had told me about it. Yeah, there was photographs taken, but I was quite young at the time. I can't really, I couldn't really remember too much about it. Um, yeah, it, it was one of them probably we borrowed some moments when, because Shoot Magazine was a, a, a magazine I always got every, massive, every yeah. week. Yeah, you know, your daddy probably paid for it, and I probably read it before he'd read it, one of them situations. So, it was a it was a, a thing we done as a group, me and Jared, and uh, I never actually seen the photo, but I've been I've been told about it a few times. Yeah, uh, my dad my dad's asked. Um, he he found out how to work Facebook to ask a question, so he did. Um, <laughs> he says he says um, that did he teach you all you know, and was he the better player? Um, he was our Jared. I call him Jared, obviously. Um, our Jared Smyson, Smyson footballer. Um, he probably was somebody I looked up to from a very early age because he was obviously a bit older than me, so I would have went to games and watched him. And he played for Oliver Plunkett probably as long as I did. And a very, very good Oliver Plunkett team when they were about 18, sort of under 18s, under 19s. And then they had like an under 20 team that played in like the youth football, which is... Um, and I would have went to watch him every week. Um, he was probably... A bit tougher than I was. He was a typical sort of right back. He, he put tackles and he didn't mean being hurt by any. He had such good players with him, you know, Jerry Clarks and John O'Connor's, Terry Quinn's. That was our George team at the time. And, and he, he played in that team and played right back week in and week out. So he was somebody looked up to. He, he probably didn't get the breaks that I got, you know, regarding that end of it. Um, but as a footballer, yeah. Absolutely, smizing, smizing football. Yeah, because he, he tells me about it, no, but then I, I, I don't know if I believe him or not. But sure. <laughs> no, no, he that I mean, he, he's he's one of those. He, he would probably be like me. I tell my kids that too, and they just sort of say, "I get on that." But <laughs> he was, and even even when he sort of stopped playing, and played a few cup matches, and, and he didn't look out of place. Um, even then, he didn't have much pace. That was that was probably was, wasn't against him. Where I had a wee bit of pace. You know, much pace, but um, there was very few wide left players or wide right players where we played would have gone past him without getting a kick in. And that's that's the type of player he was, which, you know, made him the player. That's exactly how he played. He liked it for the tackling. Um, but a good football, a good football brain. Um, yeah. And yeah, he definitely was somebody he looked up to as a younger brother. Uh, the last question for you uh, Mickey Longstaff from Crumlin has asked about, um, is the worst sight you've ever seen in football? Uh, Napper, Speedos, Napper and a pair of Speedos eating a lolly in a coaching trip? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Napper, Napper at any stage isn't a good sight, but certainly the pair of Speedos, <laughs> he's, uh, he's an absolute nightmare. But, uh, at the funniest sight, the same where Big Napper was, we... At the Crumlin, probably like any club, at the last game of the season, we all sort of made this thing, we sat in the change room, had a couple of beers. Um, and if you know Napper, you know Napper's a big bully, he likes to hit people and slap them and do this because he's a yeah. big fella. Um, so we're all sitting after the last game of the season, the club has applied a few cases of beer and stuff like that. 
So Nabo was going around hitting people, slaps in the head and blah, blah, blah. So he happened to sit down to take his trousers off, uh, his tracksuit bottoms or whatever. And a few of the players grabbed the biggest ice bucket you've ever seen in your life and poured it over the top of his head. And he didn't know who it was, so he ran about for about an hour trying to find out who it was to hit them and slap them. And then as he was <laughs> running out of the team, he fell on his backside. And as he fell, another ice bucket came and came on top of him. And a sight was so funny because it took about 12 minutes to try and lift him up again. <laughs> but that I was I was big napper and that's that's the way it is. You know, he took it all in fun, but uh yeah, an absolute nightmare to say. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh Patty, thanks very much for, for uh giving up your time and I really enjoyed the chat and obviously a lot of stuff I found out as well. I didn't even realise about your career management as well. So yeah. it's good to yeah. find out, of course. Um but thanks very much for doing it. I really so appreciate it. Um no problem. and best of luck next season. I hope all goes well for you. Um podcast the podcast is sponsored by Learners Ross Driving School and Jumbo Park Racecourse. And we'll be back next week with another interview. Thanks very much for watching or listening, folks. Okay, cheers, guys.